Hello and welcome back to uh, Protect Life here, Breaking Consensus. I'd like to first of all welcome you all. And before we get started today, I'd like you to remember two things. You can see the subscribe button there. Uh, so if you can click on that, uh, you'll be reminded of any upcoming material or new content that we have. And the donate button is there. You know, these times are tough and in COVID and post COVID, we haven't been able to get out and do the normal kinds of meetings we would. Anything you could give would be really appreciated and we can promise you it will be used to the best of our abilities. Today, I am very, very happy and we're honoured to be able to welcome Senator Steve Daines, who's a senator from Montana, previously the uh, congress, congressman from Montana in the Atlantic District. And Senator Steve Daines is a prominent uh, voice for life uh, within the Republican Party and a leader in the pro-life and a founder, I believe, if I'm not wrong, of the Republican Pro-Life Caucus. Thank you for joining us very much, Senator Daines. I'm glad to be with you. So we live in momentous times, historic times, uh, a day which I don't know, I'm sure you hoped in your heart and maintained faith that would come, but at times I'm sure it was hard to believe it would come. We have gone, we reached a culmination, not of it's not the end of a, of a debate or the end of a history, but it's it's a it's a, an important moment. So, could you just explain for a moment to our viewers here in Ireland and abroad, first of all, what the situation that pertained as a result of, of Roe in the United States, or be, what was there before, and then how Roe changed that, and now what the situation is because of Dobbs? Yeah, well, if, if um, you go back in history, it was 1973 when the United States Supreme Court ruled that uh, there was a, they, they put in place a constitutional right, even though the United States Constitution is silent on the issue of abortion, the court said they, there was a right to an abortion. Um, that resulted in the deaths of approximately 63 million babies from 1973 until uh, recent history. What happened with the Dobbs case, the Dobbs case was a uh, case that came out of the state of Mississippi. And it, it said that uh, we are gonna protect a little baby's life at 15 weeks in the womb. So it, it, it stopped abortions at 15 weeks of gestation. That case was then taken to the United States Supreme Court and that was the ruling that our Supreme Court justice made that overturned the Roe v. Wade case of 1973 and upheld the Dobbs case from Mississippi. And what Justice Alito said, who wrote the majority opinion, it was very clear. It's a brilliant opinion, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it simply said there's no constitutional right to an abortion. In fact, our founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence said that uh, we have these inalienable rights and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You cannot have liberty and the pursuit of happiness without first having the most fundamental right, which is life. So Justice Alito said, there's no constitutional right to an abortion and we're gonna return the power back to the people. We're going to let elected officials decide where the protection should be placed. That would be both state officials and federal officials. But I think that is a very wise opinion. Let the de democratic process work its way on this very contentious issue. It's a polarizing issue. But we shouldn't have nine men in black robes in 1973 decide this. Let elected officials decide this. And so the court has ruled now we're turning this back to the legislative bodies across the United States. So does, in essence, this means that what uh, the legal position of Irish abortion in the United States is returned you know, to what it pre previously had been. So there will have been states, I think because people misunderstand this outside of the United States, if, if this is my understanding, correct me if I'm saying, before Roe versus Wade, there were states where abortion was legal. And correct. maybe states like New York, which had quite liberal laws in other states where it would not have been legal or there would have been very controlled and that's what is going to pertain in the future is it so you're going to have a variety of laws you think 
mm -hmm. across the United States. But this will allow some states, if the voters of those states wish it, to introduce highly restricted or almost uh, almost uh, bans on abortion, should the people of that state wish it. Is that right? That's correct. So you'll have states that are more conservative, a state like an Oklahoma, as an example, or a Texas, uh, that will, uh, they had what we called trigger laws put in place that said if the court overturned Roe v. Wade, then these other laws would go into effect. Uh, so you'll have some states that may uh, put, for example, like Texas has, we call a heartbeat law, which is basically mm -hmm. six to eight weeks protects babies gestationally. Um, there will be something I think Oklahoma is going to go back to uh, probably conception, as you mentioned, uh, New York, California, Massachusetts, some of these more liberal states, at least in mm -hmm. terms of their elected officials, uh, will likely codify abortion up until the point of birth. I will wait and see what they do, but that's what the, the Democrats at the federal level are trying to do that. We already had a vote in the U.S. Senate mm -hmm. where they wanted to codify what we call Roe v. Wade, which would allow abortion up until the moment of birth. That could you, sorry, could you explain that? Because that was confusing to me. I know to a lot of people that the idea that it, how, how would that work, that, that, that Congress would be in a position to legislate for all of the states in, in, in a way, even if individual states didn't want to have that kind of legislation? How, how would that work? So that's correct. That, that would be where a federal law would then preempt a state law. So um, now you might ask, well, wait a minute, the Supreme Court just ruled uh, mm -hmm. that this is returned back to elected officials. Well, they did say elected officials, that's state elected officials, that's federal elected officials. So if the federal government made a law that, that uh, codified Roe v. Wade, that would overrule the, uh, uh, the protections in the, in the states. And, and, but it's chilling. It's chilling to think that virtually, well, every Democrat supported that. And that, would put, that puts the United States in probably the most radical and extreme position in the world. There's only seven countries in the world that allow you know, the latest term abortions, the United States is one of those prior to Roe v. Wade. It would include countries like North Korea, like China, uh, the, the Netherlands in, in Europe, of course. So that, that's why um, we defeated it. And that's why we believe the best path forward is to let the states continue to lead on those protections. But I think there still is a role for us in the federal government we want to make sure we don't allow taxpayer dollars to go to abortions. That's called the Hyde protections. We will stand firmly for that. I'd like to see us uh, pass laws that we can go as far as we possibly can here, probably maybe either a heartbeat bill federally or a, a we call the pain capable, the 15 week bill when a baby can feel pain in the womb. So there's still a role to, for us to fight federally, but I think the outcomes because we don't have the votes in the federal government in the United States to get this passed, most mm -hmm. of the outcomes of changing law will be occurring in the states. I think that's something I'd like you to speak to just briefly if you could, because I think in the European progressive media, this was reported as being some kind of incredible rollback and it was an incredibly regressive action, et cetera. But as I understand it, under Roe, you had, there was, a, it granted legal access to the to abortion up to 40 weeks right which would in virtually every almost every european country would it be regarded as barbaric i mean most european countries you have anywhere between 6 8 12 and 15 weeks uh, limits outside of various particular exceptions so i think a lot of people didn't understand the 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 amplitude of role yeah, so right it, it, you're exactly right. And uh, it, when President Biden was over in Europe recently with some of his NATO meetings, he, he made some references about uh, uh, Roe. Uh, but the reality is the United States has far fewer protections for the unborn than the vast majority of European countries. I believe there's only three, three European countries that would have more barbaric uh, protections for the unborn than um, 
uh, than the United States. And so really the United States is an outlier for the rest of the world. And, uh, and so if you think about what happened with Roe v. Wade, it's just a, it's taking the United States, hopefully pushing us back into even more the mainstream for the rest of the world versus being a radical outlier with just three countries in Europe as well as North Korea and China. Which is not company you want to be in, obviously. It's not where I want to be or not no. where we want to be as America. And I think the mainstream media has, has frankly been telling lies about what's happening here. And this is going to return the debate, a thoughtful debate, back to the states and back to the federal government to let legislators debate this where they're closest to the people, where they can be held accountable for their vote instead of nine members of the Supreme Court in black robes. Is it, could it be said that while we don't want to in any sense discount the importance of this victory, because if in nothing else, we know that this is actually going to save lives. I mean, in the most basic sense mm -hmm. that, and that has an absolute value that we, we should, we can't diminish. Even the save one life has to be regarded as a victory. Mm -hmm. Is this a victory for the pro-life movement in the United States, or is it more really a victory which has been created through politics and through the Republican Party, in the sense that it, we get here because President Donald Trump succeeds in appointing three judges to the Supreme Court. In a sense, the Republicans win the battle for the for the court and end up with so rather than we succeeded, we in the movement, shall we say, or you in, in the United States succeeded in convincing people to move on. That Do you think that there has been a success in, a move, in moving the people towards a more pro-life position from Roe? Uh, we have, and the, the polling data would support that argument. Um, and I, I think part of the reason we're seeing an increasing pro-life uh, opinion in the United States is because of the, uh, the progress we've made with technology, with 3D yeah. ultrasounds. Um, whenever I am engaging young people, like they'll come back to Washington, D.C., young high school students from my state of Montana will have a chance to sit in my office and they'll ask me questions. And they'll ask me a question about this, I mean, abortion and, and Roe v. Wade. And I ask them, do you have a smartphone in your hand? And they all do. And so I ask them, I'll give you an example here. I ask them, take, take your phone and Google 15 week baby, type of one five week baby. And they do that. And because that's what the Dobbs case in Mississippi, that's where they drew the line says, we, yeah. we cannot abort a baby after 15 weeks of gestation. And they look at the image and I tell them to click on the image. So here, here is the image, right? Let me just show it, the screen. Wow, that, yes. That's a 15 week baby. Yes. Okay. And so, it is clearly a baby. Yeah. So when you look at it, um, I ask them, and, I, and I, rather than tell them what to believe, I just ask them the question. And I said, if the NASA scientists had launched the Mars lander and it lands on Mars, and this is the first image that comes back from the Mars lander, these brilliant PhD scientists would be asked the question, is there life on Mars? <laughs> and when you look at that, you'd say, that is a life. But you don't have to go that far. Just ask these students, is that a little baby or not? And yeah, so it's yeah. moving, I think it's moving it from a hypothetical ideological discussion to the reality of life. And yeah. these 3D ultrasounds, the miracle of God in creating these babies is before our very eyes. And, and so as we have pulled it, it, it always depends on how you ask the question. But if you try to be objective and fair in asking the question and simply say, do you believe there should be protections for little babies uh, in late term and, and not allow late term abortions versus abortion up to the point of birth? Overwhelmingly, over 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of the American people say yes. We should have some protections in place now. Now, it, it, but these numbers continue to get better and better for us, and I think it's because of technology. I, I remember when I was a student, and I, I read the, the returns from the, the Harvard Ad Hoc Committee, 
which was advising the court on Roe v. Wade. And it was very clear, other than the fact that it was clear the court completely ignored all of the, tech, the expert advice, but that there was an expectation on, shall we say, the, 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 the permissive side of, of the argument that the technology would show them to be right. And in fact, it just went completely the opposite direction. I'm aware uh, uh, that you're under time pressure. So just in the last couple of minutes here, I wonder from your experience in the United States, um, when engaging in discourse, in discourse dialogue on what is absolutely a polarizing issue, an issue that people feel very strongly about on both sides, how do you think you have most successfully advanced this? And particularly, how do you engage young people? How do you talk to young people who are constantly bombarded by propaganda mm -hmm. in the media, at school sometimes, through their peers, through social, uh, on social media, on the internet? What do you, how do you successfully engage in them? How do you start to turn the idea? Yeah, so a couple of things. First of all, tone and tenor matter. And I think if we're screaming and we're angry, mm -hmm. uh, that does not persuade. I think that drives people away. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to be very compassionate, you know, in, in the pro-life movements and it's out of caring and love for moms and babies and to make sure that, uh, you know, we are, as we say, um, shedding more light than heat as it relates mm -hmm. to the, you know, the, 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 the debate. Um, so that, 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 that's why I think it's sort of first is tone and tenor. Then it gets into the um, uh, thinking about life, pro-life in its broadest terms. And as I think about pro-life, it's not only protecting the pre-born, it's also respecting and protecting the elderly. Mm -hmm. It's respecting and protecting those who have disabilities mm -hmm. because every life is valuable um, in, the, in the eyes of God and should be valued in the eyes of our society. Um, and then we also, though, need to be firm in refuting the lies that are out there. There are lies being told about mm -hmm. ectoptic pregnancies. For example, somehow women will not be able to uh, terminate an ectoptic pregnancy where a woman's life is at risk. Well, that, that, the, the pro-life community uh, would allow that, etc. of course, uh, because it was never a baby to begin with. And so we've got to combat the lies that are out there. So share the truth but share it with compassion and care. And then also when we can uh, ask questions, and that's why I gave you that example when I engage young people, I, I just ask them to tell me what they think that 15 week baby is. Let them come to their conclusion. Um, and when they do, they'll, they'll believe it uh, versus me telling them what to believe. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. I know our, 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 our viewers and listeners would like to thank you. We've been talking today uh, very generously to Senator Steve Daines. I'd like to thank him. I'd like to thank all of our viewers who have joined us here today. Uh, again, invite you to help us if you can. And anything you can do for us, we promise will be used to support those pro-life values that we all share. Thank you very much. Goodbye and God bless. God bless you too. Thank you.